So but I, but my stipulation was if I got to pick the topics. So this is actually one of my favorite topics is more the gym culture type things. Um, so this one is gonna be about called developing coachable athletes. So, um, but anyway, again, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, happy to answer any questions you might have or send you a video or send you the entire lecture or whatever, so. Okay, so with that said, um, who likes I don't know, can you guys hear me? I, we're communicating good enough. If I stray too much and you can't hear me, what do you do? Okay, now you can then? I'll try, they'll steer me straight or the tech guy will do it. All right, the tech guy will do it for us. Come further up the front. Anyway, I, love this. I don't know if this is real or if someone made this up. It's like a playing card, you know, like a trading card. There. Yeah. Okay, so pros, look at what his pros are. Heart, gone size. So, your size doesn't matter. It should have. I mean, this guy tried to play with a great football team and he lasted with them for two years. So, so anyways, um, does anybody know how to develop desire? Dang it. If someone ever raises their hand, I'm going to get on a meeting with that person. If we knew how to coach desire, we'd be billionaires, I swear. So that I think is one of our challenges as a coach, getting our athletes to want to get better. So um, those of you who really saw this clip right there, this is um, at the end, end of the movie, there's a, towards the end, there's a guy that was a really, really talented guy, but he was he, his heart was never in it. He was there because his dad was a Notre Dame football player. He was pretty gifted. He was a talented player. He kind of blew up at the end because Rudy basically sacked him on the last practice of the season. Um, and you can kind of read the quote there, but, but his coach was like, you know, he just sunk up his entire starting career because he was mad that Ruby was trying so hard. You know, did you ever have to tell your own kids that in your gym? I've done it numerous times where, um, I, I remember our first, this was probably about 30 years ago, our first elite kid ever, we almost lost her when she was 15. You know why? The other kids were jealous of how hard she worked and they didn't treat her well in the gym. So we had to have a conversation where we're saying, you know what, sometimes it's not about them, it's about you. You know, we should never feel bad about outworking them. In fact, that's one of the things we try to tell our kids to do is to try to outwork everybody that they're gonna compete against. That should be a goal of theirs. So, so anyways. So in my mind, I don't know, everybody's different, but I think those are the most fun athletes to coach, not the most talented, but the ones with the biggest heart, the ones that are gonna give you the most, give you all, you know that. So this is one of my favorite quotes from that movie. You're five foot nothing, hundred and nothing, and you have nearly a speck of athletic ability. And you hung in there with the best college football team in the land for two years, and you're gonna walk out of here with a degree from the University of Notre Dame. In this life, you don't have to prove nothing to nobody but yourself. I mean, anybody remember that line? Oh man, I love that movie. Success, to me, we try to define success in our program of making the most of the talent available, okay? So if you come in there with level, I mean, who's that the kid that come in that came in there and you thought maybe had level seven talent, but they made it all the way up to level nine? Ultimate success, man. There was a kid, have anybody here from Minnesota? There was a kid, remember the, remember the Minnesota Athlete of the Year from about three or four years ago? I'm, I'm bragging about this one. She came out of our gym. She was a level nine with about this much talent. She should have been a level eight, career level eight, but she made it up to level nine and went to level nine Westerns for two years. Um, the absolute nicest, hardest working, best teammate of everything. And, and that the state of Minnesota thought enough of that kid they named her, you know, the whatever, the Minnesota athlete of the year that year. So. There's a girl in my gym who still talks about her. Now you from Missouri. We were on, she went, we were on, uh, Together. You guys rotated with us. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So you know Brooke, you know who I'm talking about. Yeah, she's awesome. Yeah, Brooke is still, she's going to be a senior in college this year, still competing all around for a D3 school. And she came in there with like, this kid does not have a lot of physical gifts. So that's all I can say. Anyways. Okay, so Coach Blair, athletes. 
There are way too many variables to be able to define clearly. You need to decide what your goals are, what tools you have, how big your gym is, what kind of, you know, what your personality is. Does personality matter and if kids are coachable to you or not? Absolutely, okay? And what your program allows, okay? Maybe you work for someone that it's all about this and you have to treat everybody super nice so that you have 85 kids on your, on your team and you don't care if they ever win and aren't they? You know, maybe you have a program that's a little more strict and that your goals are, I wanna get them as good as I can, I wanna, you know, it, it depends, right, on what your environment is, so, um, and what your personality can allow. I used to be the bad guy. Do you think you need a bad guy to push kids? I used to be that guy, now I just hire them. Mm -hmm. No, just kind of, but really, do you think, do you think kids have to be pushed to achieve their maximum? I do, I do, I, I, I'm, I'm a, you know, as a hobby, I'm a runner. Do you think I would get as good as I was as a runner if I, if no one told me, you know, it's raining, Mike, you still need to put that run in, right? So you don't always get to do what you want. So anyways, I'm kind of going off topic here. So, um, so anyways, coachable athletes, you get to set what you need for your program. You need to make sure that what you're trying to provide is a good fit for what that kid will bring to your program and what, you know, it's gotta be a win-win, okay? And what is that, moving on, so. Here's the way I define a coachable athlete. Athletes that are fun to coach, receptive to new ideas, have the basic tools to progress, um, and they're a good influence on the rest of the team. So, your job as a coach, create a culture that encourages and rewards them for being coachable. Um, educate your athletes on how to become coachable. What does your preschool teacher do every time they get a group, brand new group of kids in preschool? Teach them to sit in line. Teach them to stand in line. Go to the dot. Oh, no, it's not your turn. Raise their hand when they want to talk, right? Is that all teaching about procedures? So why do we forget about that when we get competitive athletes and all we do is teach the nuts and bolts of flipping and, and strength and that? How about if we spend some time educating them on the things that will help them be a better athlete? Usually those are things that will help them be a better person too. So. Things like, well, we'll get into some of those as we go on, but, um, so, and convince them that it's important to work on that. Um, give them a good background in the physical preparation, the mental preparation, and basics so they have the tools to progress as far as their talent and desire will take them. Okay, things that we're gonna address, the why, the when, the how, okay? All right, why is it important? Who likes to work with coachable athletes? Fun, right? Who likes to work with the 13-year-old bratty kid that rolls her eyes at you when you get make her tell her she's got to work harder on strength? Right? So it makes our job easier and more enjoyable. Um, who has trouble hiring a staff? Common theme in this sport, right? Okay. One thing you can do to help alleviate that is if, if you produce an environment that makes athletes very coachable, do you think more coaches might want to work with that program? I think that's, I mean, I, I really think um, that, that's a huge deal. You know, they're gonna want it. Everyone wants to enjoy their job every day. So um, if a gym doesn't pay attention to that, you think you're gonna have much luck hiring a good coach? Hey, guess what? Come to us, we're gonna pay you more. I'll bet, you know, these 20 kids are kind of bratty, but you know, they're not very coachable, but, but we're gonna pay you more. Is that gonna get a really good coach to your program? How about if you say, you know what, I can't afford that. I'm gonna pay you two bucks less than that other gym, but you know what? Our kids are so nice, they're gonna work their butts off for you. They're gonna they're gonna nod their head, they're gonna, you know, agree to what you say. Do you think you'll have better luck hiring coaches that way? Make your kids better kids. I think you'll have a better time developing staff. So um, synergy. Will that help? Will a, will a good coachable athlete help the rest of the team? Absolutely. Um, what is the first question a college coach asks when they take a, start taking a look at one of your athletes? Are they coachable? <laughs> and that's smart of their part, right? Okay, they know what they can do gymnastically. They see that, right? They don't come in there and just watch. Oh, here's a physical specimen, man. This kid's doing toe backs or eight feet high, and no, they come in, they see, the watch what the kid does between turns, not during the turns. They already know that. So are these kids coachable? Are they gonna be a good influence to my group of 14 college athletes on the team? Um, so it, it will make them more marketable. Um, have you ever had a college coach shy away from one of your real talented kids because they sus suspected some issues? 
and you don't want to add, who knows that, what, who's ever experienced one bad kid on your team? Wrecks the atmosphere of the whole thing. Happens, right? Okay. So let's try to either one, eliminate that by not selecting those kids, or put a system in place that will self correct that, or worst case, eliminate that. Okay. Um, so I think why is it important? If you work on making them more coachable, you're giving them tools, not just to make them tools, it'll make them more greater chance of success, not in just gymnastics, but in life. Right? Is coachability important when you get out in the job market? Is it important when you get married and start a family? Is it important in everything in life? You know, in, well, is anybody too old to stop learning? Yep. Bingo. Yeah. All right, so best advice my dad ever gave me. It ain't about the money, Mike. Find a job you love. You know, this is that famous quote. I, didn't, I did not realize Winston Churchill was giving credit for this quote, so probably a lot of other people are too, but. Uh, so this one's been, I'm, I've had this slide on a lot of my lectures for gym cultures over the years, but what is the, I just kind of like this quote. I have no idea who this guy is, but what is the atmosphere like in the gym? I've come to the frightening conclusion that I am the decisive element in the classroom. It's my daily mood that makes the weather as a teacher. I possess tremendous power to make a child's life miserable or joyous. I can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or humor, hurt or heal. In all situations, it is my response that decides whether a crisis will be escalated or de-escalated and a child humanized or dehumanized. So the frightening thing is, is we control the environment of our program. Okay, and I use, I think, I think we use that same approach to, the, to our staff too. All right, you know, we can either be, accept the drama, create more drama, or we can, you know, we control the atmosphere of it. So, um, and, and I think the frightening thing is, who's ever got this comment from a parent? I remember the first time I, first time I got this, I will never forget it, it was about like a, two, a year or two ago, morning in gym, and we were doing conferences with the kids, and a parent said, well, you know, you actually spend more hours with, my, with our daughter than, than we do, therefore, I'm like, that's right. I mean, I, that's what it hit me. It really hit me about two years into owning a club where I'm like, oh my God, we spend more time with these kids and their parents do. So we owe it to them, I think, to help develop, help them develop their kids, you know, a good environment. Yeah, question. So you had gymnasts, you, you talk about what they do between turns. So you had gymnasts that work really hard between turns, and then you have gymnasts in the same group that don't work very hard between turns. Yeah. So what is your go-to? Them to the bleachers because you can only say so many times you need to hear mm -hmm. you do this. And I'm, I'm, broken records. So I'm old. I, I'm, I'm too tired to yell at kids. I laid the guilt trip on them. So we have, we have a lot. Guilt trip. The guilt trip is, and we tell our kids this a lot we will give you the effort that you give back to us. So then you just ignore them if they're not doing what they're supposed we, to do. We, and it'll come up later in the lecture too, but we encourage, I mean, we try to educate them on things like you want to get good. If, here's one, get your whole group of kids sitting down in front of you, ask them sometimes, you got, say you got 20 optional kids sitting in front of you, 20 compulsory kids, whatever, 20 competitive kids, how many of you want to get, want to be the best in this room? Every hand's going to go up, right? You say, all right, this isn't rocket science. Who's going to get, who's going to get the best? The kid that takes the least turns or the kid that takes the most turns? The kid that takes the most turns. So we joke, it's actually, actually it's not even a joke, we encourage our kids to butt in line. We never yell at a kid that but I've, I've never yelled at a kid that butted in line from a team program ever. In fact, I praise that kid. I yell at the kid that was moving too slow to allow them to butt in front of them. And then, if you've got good kids in the past, you know, maybe you had a kid that was like a, a level, like a level nine or ten national champion. Sometimes you can say, now who took more turns on bars last year than anybody else? That kid. How did it work out for her? You know, so. Th those mental things that, you know, it's not about just the flip or the tight legs or the whatever, it's about that kid took more turns. That's why she got better. You know, it's, again, it's not all about the talent. It's about, it, we're trying to develop work ethic, so. So then what about, you have the athlete that seems to suck other athletes in with their conversation, with their talking. Teenage girls. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a never-ending battle. Um, I, I used to do a, a, another lecture about motivation, 
And one of my favorite quotes in that, I think it's, it's uh, Mark Twain. He's like, motivation is like bathing. I recommend both daily. Um, so it's, it, it's, I wish I had an easy fix for that, but another, another, I guess another phrase we used to use around our gym for years is, um, I'll never forget after about being 10, 15 years in, we were having some, a fair amount of success in Minnesota. And I remember other clubs would come up to us and I just don't love this one. They'd be like, how come you get all the good kids? And how come you get all the nice kids? Oh, that was it. How come you get all the nice kids? Like, so we used to, as, jokingly as a staff behind the scenes, like, you get the behaviors you allow. We, 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 we taught them to be nice. We expected them to be nice. Um, but I, I'll, I'll admit, I mean, even this year, my graduating senior class was horrible. It was like, I had a bunch of those kids that you asked about that sucked the others in. Um, and who thinks that the environment is even harder now than it was five years ago? Thank you, Safe Sport. So, I'm sorry, I won't say any more about that before I get into that. Um, <laughs> when did sexual abuse get evolved into harsh coaching? I don't get it. I, never mind. I am going to shut up right now before I get in trouble and get a man from USA forever. But anyways, I'm not afraid. If you don't know my opinion, not to do. I'm not a fan of that. So, um, yeah, and I'll be honest, I started a club 33 years ago. You know why I started a club? I wanted to prove that you could develop high level. High level. I told numerous people this, probably even the banker. I said, I want to prove that you can develop high level kids without being a jerk. And I don't think that's, in fact, I think it helps you develop high level kids. But does that mean I'm never going to yell at a kid? Have you ever yelled at a three-year-old toddler who was about ready to touch the stove? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, kids need guidance. So anyway, I'm off topic again, but hopefully, hopefully that helped a little bit. Um, so anyway, we just have to remember that, yes, we are in control of the atmosphere in our gym. And, um, you know, and, and, and we play a really important part of these kids' lives. So. Here's another one, I just saw this one. John Wooden, anything out of John Wooden is a gem. But I saw this quote when I was preparing this lecture. A good coach can change a game. A great coach can change a life. You know what, these kids are gonna, they're not gonna remember, them. they will remember the wins that we helped them achieve, but they're gonna remember the experience a lot more than that, you know? Um, so anyways. So when, when you work on this, all the time. Okay, um, you know, when do we do strength? Every day. When do we do skills? Every day. When do we do flexibility? Every day. So why don't we work on the mental side of things every day, okay? Um, you know, who lines your kids up at the end and talks to them for a couple minutes before you leave every day? Good time, throw in some things about, hey, you worked hard, you took more turns, you know, disappointing day to day, you didn't take that many turns, you know, it's, um, Teach them that stuff during that time. So we teach it daily. Start from day one. Don't we teach preschool kids to stand in line and follow rules? Let's teach our higher level kids good habits as well. And teach them things to do inside and outside of the gym. Okay, we can't control what they do outside of the gym, but can we influence it? I think we can, right? They look up, I think when people do surveys about people they look up to, coach is usually right under parent. I mean, we are very influential in these kids' lives. So, um, and so we can make suggestions. A lot of times, they'll, you just have to watch, we attract a lot of time. I don't know if we, do we attract type A kids or do we develop them? <laughs> I don't know which is right there, but, but we have a lot of them. I know you know that. So you have to watch the kids that, that go overboard and take things that we say too much. Huh? Well, that's the room shaking. What? Oh, yeah, the is it? Room is they don't have room Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Really? Yeah. I missed that. I was like, this. <laughs> this. We're fine. We're fine. Keep up. <laughs> right. So we're going to teach them to be 24-7 jokes. We're good. Okay. Yeah. So the big one first when do we work on this all the time we are what we repeatedly do excellence then is not an act but a habit 
Aristotle, pretty smart guy, huh? Okay, here's another one. Anyone ever read anything from Malcolm Gladwell? Brilliant author, author, love his stuff. So um, this is, I don't know what this one's from, but um, you know, tipping point he did. What's the one I'm thinking of? Oh, outliers. Oh, wow. Outliers, very, very insightful to what we do. You know, it's all about what makes people good at their craft in general. So, um, you ever heard of the 10,000 hour rule? Basically, to summarize Malcolm, that book, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell, it's success is when preparation meets opportunity. That whole book is basically about that. He said for every Beatles, there was another band that just didn't get the good luck. They put in the 10,000 hours, they just were in the wrong place at the wrong time. For every Bill Gates, there was probably five other guys designing computers in the garage that just, the luck just wasn't on their side. But, you know, but you need both people, both places. You have to put in the time so when the opportunity comes, you're ready to take it. So, practice isn't the thing you do once you're good, it's the thing that makes you good. Put in the 10,000 hours, then when the opportunity comes, you're ready for it, so. All right, so how? That'll be the rest of this talk. These are, you know, hopefully some ideas that and again, this is just stuff that we've done. Hopefully, if I can present one or two things, tidbits that you can take out of this, it'll help your own program. That'll be great. So it's definitely not a cookie cutter approach. It's not. There's not one way to do it. Um, you know, there's multiple ways. So it's going to mostly be environmental things. So building a team culture. Um, so number of ways to do that. But I think has anyone ever? had that day where you're driving up to the gym, you park your car, and you're just like, oh, I don't want to go in today. Anybody have been there and done that? Mm -hmm. Think of why that usually is. One, you might be tired, but it might be, oh, I have to walk by that parent that I had that. Or maybe you got, a tr maybe you got that one troublemaker kid, and you don't know how to address that group of five seniors that are just driving you crazy, you know, that's, right? So, um, so build, so if you can build a team culture that you, every day you get out of that car, you can't wait to get into the gym. That's kind of what the goal is, right? Get an environment that you really enjoy being in. So, um, and I would start with your staff, get the entire staff to buy into that concept. Because um, who's ever been there on a day where you just can't bring it? If you have to, I preach big team programs, by the way. So because, because of that, our higher level kids have about seven coaches that work with them on any given day. So do you suppose if two of those coaches, maybe, you know, one, I got a couple of coaches with young babies at home. You suppose if one of our coach comes in and he got like two hours of sleep last night because the baby kept him, what do you think he's gonna be really energetic the next day? You know, or the other one that had knee surgery last week or well, with seven of us, somebody's gonna be in a good mood. Somebody can bring the energy, you know? So anyways. So um, how do you build a good team culture? One, selection procedures. Um, what qualities do you want in your program? Um, who's got a fairly extensive um, selection procedure to your competitive programs? I'll just tell you what we shoot for. We shoot for a two-week trial. Doesn't always happen, but um, we like to look at kids for two weeks because anybody can be good for a day, right? Anybody can fool you for a day, two days three days, right? Um, you know, so I, what, the last thing we want to do is commit to a kid. We, we feel that once we accept them into our team program, it's our responsibility. You know, they better be, they, they better be something really, 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 really bad before we remove them from our team program. Um, so we, we actually are very careful with how we select kids. And is, is it always talent? No. I mean, we purposely grew our program very slowly when we started. Um, and we were trying to select a certain type of kid, the kid that was going to bust their butt for us and work hard. And you know, two examples of that. I remember one was, I will never forget this one, because this kid ended up competing for us, coaching for us, and whatever. But um, question? I was just curious how you're doing on your selection program for parents. <laughs> I actually, I actually, I actually know, actually know a gym in Minnesota that interviews the parents as part of that process. I have not done that. Um, it's I did have a coach tell me once about 15 years ago. His next plan, I don't know if he was joking or not. But he said, he said for the next cycle, 
His plan was he was just going to go to the inner city and just get a bunch of orphan kids. <laughs> so you know where his head was at. So, um, but any, anyways, it's um, is it nice to talk to the parents? Yeah, because you don't get the insight into the kids. But um, anyways, we had I remember this one case where there was we had this one kid started to week trial, not very talented at all, but quiet as a mouse, did what we asked, worked real hard. Started week two, two of her teammates that were better than her, better than her, more talented. She was like a seven or eight. These kids were like level nines, fairly talented. They came in, worked pretty hard for us the first week. Then the other kid finished her two-week trial. We accepted her. And the other two kids, you could just almost see the flip switch in their head. They're like, ah, oh, they took her work. She would. Second week. They stopped working hard, they stayed they stand in line, they wouldn't take enough turns. I will never forget that conference. This was back when I was more active with my team program, so I still did the conferences. And because we weren't gonna take either kid, we did both kids together. We put two moms and two kids in the office. And I'm like, you know what, I, I just don't think they're a good fit for our program right now. You should have seen the look on their parents' faces, I think, and more, more so the kids. And we did not take them, because they just didn't, have the work ethic or the drive that we thought was going to, we thought they were going to develop into those kids that we all talked about. You know, the ones that drag others down. Yeah, question? Yes. I, um, <clears throat> you made mention to your most recent senior class that mm -hmm. was terrible or awful. You keep I shouldn't say that. They're not awful. No. They're, they all, let's just say they all grew up at different times. Yes, and, yeah. and I get that. I'm just wondering what can you learn from that collection? from when they were selected? I'm just curious. I would, what I can learn is that it's not an exact process. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering if you could pinpoint anything that would have given you any indication that it wouldn't have worked out later down the line. No. Hormones. Yeah. So when you do your selection process, so like in April we had team tryouts. So mm -hmm. do you take all of the new girls to your team and they all had two weeks and it's kind of hard to judge. So you don't do your team tryouts like that? We just mix them in. We, we talk to them, figure out what level they would probably fit best in and train with that. So you come up one at a time. You don't have a day where you say on this day we're going to have team tryouts. No. Although I have thought about, this is an idea that's been floating around my head for the last year or so. My, my other daughter, I had two daughters. One was a gymnast. The other one was a dancer. What did dancers do? Try out every year. Um, yeah, audition every year. I'm thinking, I wonder if that concept has ever been tried in gymnastics. I, yeah, school team. Okay. Every year I, show up and make that team again. I mean, that's one way that I, I wish someone would try it so I could quiz them on it. And, but I mean, that would be a way to weed out those troublemaker kids. So how do you, so how do, you do it in the middle of the season? Do you just we don't. We don't accept a middle of the season. Yeah. We just we have we've been blessed with a big team program for a number of years, so we have limited space. So if, if someone calls us, usually if they call in the middle of the season, it's because if I take that back, if they move to the area, we'll do a tryout mid season. If they're just at another local club and wanting to switch, usually it's because they're pissed off at the other club. And the one thing that I've never taken a kid, if they come in to talk to us and badmouth their old club, I've never taken them. To me, that's a that's a red flag. They, that means they. If, what's to say that if they didn't like it where they were, why are they going to like it better where we're at? We've only accepted kids that have outgrown their other club. Um, I'll be honest. I just had a conversation actually today here with a mom who is at a club. Her daughter is a going to be a tenth grader. I'm like, what's your training group like? Well, it's me and four other kids that are under the age of ten. Get it? That's a, that's a case where I would talk to that family because maybe she would have company in our program or she doesn't in her own program. Um, and I know one thing that taking other taking kids from other programs is always a touchy subject. I think for everybody. Um, I'll be honest. I think early on in my growth, I know this helped me. I talked to. Maybe I shouldn't use his name, but. Um, now, you can guess who it is, but anyways, I was talking to a coach and his wife at, a, at dinner one night at a training camp or something, and I said, is it, does it bother you when people move to your city to start training with you? 
and he at, at, at across, the, across the dinner table, he's like, Mike, he said, let me put it this way. If you're sitting across your desk from two parents and you, you, you know that you have a, a, a program that's gonna suit their daughter's needs better, how can you tell that parent, no, I'm not gonna give you the opportunity to do what's best for your child? I'm like, to me, that hit me like a brick. I'm like, I get it. You know, it's not all about the, just taking the kid, it's about doing what's best for that kid. Um, so, mm -hmm. so you have a month, so say your competitions are over June, you say I'm gonna look at all of my class girls and I'm gonna say, I wanna try out this girl, this girl, this girl, this that's, girl. That's an odd, if kids are from already in our program, that's an ongoing thing already anyways. We will do what you said there. Like the see in the month of May, our compulsory program usually recommends, here's five kids we think are gonna be ready to move up to level seven. So we will do that with a group of kids internally, but I'm talking more externally type kids coming into our program, so. Any others? Yeah, go ahead. Um, our competitive team makeup stems heavily from our developmental program. Um, so I guess my question is, do you have selection procedures that help you find these attitudes and behaviors within kids that are... I and that's why we do it for, we try to do it for two weeks. Well, we, and we do a lot of research. Um, you know, if, if, if it's a kid moving in, we'll, we'll try to, we'll, if it's a kid moving in, for sure we'll talk to the parents. We want to know why. If they're like, oh, because we're going to move our family of six to, to Minnesota, Minnesota to train with you guys, and because and, she's going to make the Olympics. <laughs> Sorry. You know, it, it, it's, we, we want to know what the whole family's thinking. Um, but again, that's why we try to do two weeks. It just gives us a more extended time. I think the other, um, which is one other example. Anyone remember a kid named Maddie Carr? Fairly successful collegiate gymnast in Denver. Um, you know, we almost did not take this kid. She did her two-week tryout, and we're like, yeah, you know what, we're, man, I hate to do this. We're not quite sure yet. Can you do one more week with us? She did a third week with us. At the end of the third week, we still weren't sure. So we said, you know what, here's what we're going to do. We're going to let you train with us for the whole summer. And then in September 1, we're going to talk again and see if, it's, see if, we, if, we'll, if we still think it's a good fit. Um, so we ended up, ended up taking her, almost didn't take her. She ended up being the most successful level 10 kid we've ever had. Um, so, but she had to buy into our work ethic and our system and all that before we took her. So that's, I, guess, I guess the general rule is be slow and be careful about your selection procedures. Make sure you know what you're adding from a personality and a work ethic standpoint, not just a talent standpoint. That question in the back. So is that only external, or when you were talking about your internal kids, like let's say at the beginning level of, of compulsory? We would do the same there, but it, it, the, the only thing that would be different is those are referrals from our own coaching staff. So you still do the two week? We try, sometimes it's a week because we already have some knowledge about these kids and we're taking a recommendation from our own staff. Right. So it's, and even then we go back and forth all the time. We're, you know. We need, we, yeah, we want them to work with the group that they're going to train with. And a lot of times we guess wrong. You know, this is a very common scenario. We tend to have, um, you know, we all get the kids from like a smaller club, maybe where their standards aren't quite as high or they're, maybe they're whatever, they just don't have the resources. So they might come in as a level eight to our club. This happens a couple times. Maybe they were a level nine at their club. They come in and we put them in their level nine group and they're like, oh, this. We think she would be better with their level eight group. So sometimes they've done one week with one group and another week with a group that we think that is a better fit for them. So we'll adjust on the fly. We'll, yeah, I think the only rule we have in our gym is we don't have rules. <laughs> Everything's a gray area. So <laughs> anyways, let's keep, let's keep plowing along here. So um, I think when you're building a team and a culture, make it an honor to be part of your team. We always tell the kids, it's a right to sign up for gymnastics at a program. You can't, we can't stop yet but it's a privilege to be on our team. You know, and the fact that we have strict selection procedures, I think the kids that are on the team usually hold their heads up and they feel proud about that and they, they wanna be a part of something. So we keep just kind of ingraining that with them. So they, we want them to feel special and, and you know, hey, you're part of the team now. Um, and definitely, definitely, definitely make it on board the raw talent. 
We've all seen that really talented kid that didn't pan out or was a cancer inside the organization because they thought they were better than the others. I don't have to take that many turns. Yes, you do. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, going on. Communication. Someone said that before. Absolutely. I think that's a great quality for a coachable athlete. Um, we've all got them. I've got them today. I mean, I've coached them last week. You ever get the kid that you give them a correction and you have no idea if it processed? Oh, yeah. I found that as I get older in coaching, I found I ask a lot more questions of my kids because I want to know what they're thinking. Did they process what I just gave them as a correction? Did they? My favorite one, and I'll use the name because if she was standing right here, I would still use it. Anyone know a kid named Abby Paulson who's at Utah right now? Mm -hmm. uh, true story. I thought she was doing that to me one day and, and not processing, but her dad's a silver medal, a silver medal wrestler in the Olympics, so she comes from a very straight laced hard work work ethic never a problem this kid this kid would give you i mean she could have one limb falling off and she'd still come in and give you a full workout but anyways one day i thought she wasn't doing anything so i'm like she landed her ball as she's walking back i'm like ah, abby I, yeah, I think bend your arms more next time so your head hits his head. i think you'll be able to push hard that way and she's like okay <laughs> Totally respectful, totally like, okay, coach, okay. Look at me in the eye. I mean, that's why I had to ask questions and I had to frame it that way. I'm like, okay, she's hearing me. She's doing all the right things, but really not processing what I'm telling her to do. So, so communication. I've got a general rule. When they're 10 and under, I'll tell them what they think. Okay. When they're like 10 to 13, I want, I want to start hearing from them, but I'm probably going to listen to what they say and usually give more guidance. By the time they get past 13, past 15, our entire staff is like, we want to know what the kids are thinking. We want them to help guide their training. We want them to have a piece in it. You know, we want them to, by the time kids are that age 15, do you suppose stuff can happen outside the gym that we don't know about when they come walking in? You know, and that, and that will affect their workout. I'm sorry, they failed their math test. They got an offender better on the way in. Their boyfriend looked at them the wrong way. They had a fight with mom at breakfast. I don't know, okay? But if they come in with that look on their face, yeah, it's important that we know that, okay? So we definitely encourage communication. So, um, oh yeah, let's see. Some other things, I got some other ideas for communication too, but um, one, don't promise them or their parents unrealistic things. Um, that's something I think we get better at over time. I don't know how many times in my first 10 years of owning a co I put a kid at the wrong level. Oh, all the time. And then I realized that was stupid. You know, but the kid really, 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 really wanted to be level nine and she was almost there. You know, every time I did that, was never, it was never the right thing to do. It was always a mistake. So we've got kind of a, a, a saying that we use, and I tell our entire staff now, I said, wouldn't you rather place a kid where we think they, she belongs have that unpleasant conversation with that kid and that parent for 15 minutes and make them successful and happy for the next nine months. Or we can, we can make them really happy in that 15 minutes. You know what? You're so close. We're going to move you. We're going to put you at the elite level this year. And then the kid, what did, you, what did they just do? The next nine months are going to be a nightmare for that kid. They don't get their assignments done. They never get an order to meet. They're frustrated. They, you know, so place them at levels where you as a coach know that they will be successful. I think that's a better, definitely a better option. So um, I don't know where I heard this quote, but help me get better with honesty rather than flattery with a lie. I think that's just a general rule, rule of thumb. Be honest with your kids. You know, we can tell every five-year-old, every six-year-old, every eight-year-old, yeah, you're going to the Olympics. Because they all believe it. And we don't know. Maybe at that age they're going to, okay? But there comes a time where reality has to play into it too. You know, if you got a 15 year old kid, 15 year old level five, and you say, we're gonna take you on our team because we're gonna make you an Olympian. No, I'm sorry, you gotta be a little more realistic than that. So think before speaking, you guys ever seen this one? It sort of applies here, but really doesn't. It's an acronym. When you speak to your athletes, think T, is it true? H, is it helpful? You know, you. I, I, who has corrections with kids that we ever hold back on? Do you think if we ever gave every single correction that we saw to the kid, it would be helpful? One, it would confuse the crap out of them because they have so many things going on that had to process it. 
And two, that would just demoralize them to a point. You know, find something they did good. That might be helpful. Hey, your arms are straight. All right, the rest, the rest was horrible, but hey, your arms are straight. Right? Find the good thing. Give them that too. So, is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? So, okay. Uh, accountability. Um, this one I think is absolutely, absolutely huge when it comes to um, developing coachable athletes. Um, how many of you have kid, our parents and have kids at home? When they bring their homework home for the night from school, are they required to do that before they go to school the next day? School teachers have done it for 200, 300 years, right? You get your work done, right? If not, maybe you have to stay up till 10, 11 o'clock, midnight, whatever, you know what? Why don't we take that same approach as a gym? So we've tried to do that, and I'll get into this a little bit more about how we do it, but, um, so, oh, I'm already one slide ahead, sorry. So develop high standards in a number of areas that hold them accountable for those standards. Again, you get the behaviors you allow. You allow them to not finish their assignments, guess what, they're probably gonna do it again, you know? So areas that we hold them accountable for, attendance, work ethic, and assignments. We'll get into that a little bit. So attendance, if they're not there, we expect them to let us know why. You know, is that okay? And oh, I'm going shopping at the mall with my friends. You know what, you haven't done that for six months. Good for you, you're a normal person. I, get, I need to leave an hour early, like, right, because I got the high school football game. Great. How about third day in a row, I've got to leave halfway through workout because I've got extra homework. That might be, that might be an issue. Right? If it comes too much, we want to know why they're missing. Therefore, we can assess, is this kid in over her head? Let's help place them where they're not in over their head. You know, so anyways, um, even when they're injured, the best results from athletes will come from the ones that spend the most time there. A um, couple examples I've got of that for our, um, you know, if we've got an athlete, Ever had a kid that has to had to miss like three months, four months, six months from a back spotty? Okay. Literally, true story. We had one of these where a kid was coming off of six months off. There's still about two, two, three, three months, two or three months in the season. We're thinking we might get in a meet or two at the end of the year. So, you know, your first day back, you're like, okay, vault, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you five times over the table. I don't care if they're timers, I don't care if we do two timers and three tops, I don't care. You know what her third turn was? A laid out fall. Because this kid wanted it so bad, she, you know how much time she missed in the six months she was off because of her spotty? She was there every single minute of every single day. This kept growing. She did her back therapy. Her core was probably stronger than it ever was before. Um, because that kid did the right things for six months and the desire was there. She stepped back way faster than anybody thought we would have. Um, and actually she ended up, I think, did two, two meets that year, regionals and nationals. So, um, another one, I think one of, one of the absolute, this one just happened this year. I think this was probably one of the biggest compliments I think I've ever gotten as a program. Um, you guys know the Oklahoma program? Pretty good, okay. One of our kids was there this year and didn't compete the all around until, I wanna say, like the last two or three weeks of the season. Um, and when she finally did the, was, got the go ahead to come back from her injury, um, Tom Haley told me, she just told me this when she was home visiting, but Tom Haley told her, she goes, oh, what is with those twisters kids? They came up from, back from the injury and they could just jump right back into things. To me, that was the biggest compliment we've ever gotten in because I know Olivia was doing what she had to do when she was injured. So that when she was given the go ahead, doctors cleared her. She was ready to step in and help her team. So, I mean, that meant more to me than, than a lot of other stuff that happened this year. So, I mean, school must come first. We've always said that, okay? But, and with, it comes with a but, okay? If they're missing too much, that's when we'll have a discussion with the kid and or her parents about their goals, about their level placement, about time management. Anyone ever get this one? Monday night, I have to leave two hours early. Why? Well, I've had so much homework. When did you get that homework? Well, last week. What did you do over the weekend? <laughs> well, I went to a shop thing at the mall. I went to a, you know, time management. I'm sorry, it's important. So if they start missing too much for school, we will have that discussion. And usually that fixes the problem right away. 
And it might be like, you know what, maybe level eight's too much for this year. Maybe we should, maybe we should just stay level seven so you have more time for your homework and we can be more forgiving with your, your schedule. So again, it's kind of a communication back and forth thing. So all right, work ethic. Explain it's not rocket science. If it was, we'd all be making six figures sitting at a desk doing a lot of fancy stuff, but getting more turns, more success. That's pretty, you know. Again, that's we had said earlier about encouraging the body in line. The more you fall, the better you're becoming. Praise work ethic. Praise work ethic, especially in the less talented kids. That's always a good one. You know, hey, you took more turns. You know, maybe it's at the lineup at the end of the night. Hey, Mary, you took so many more turns than everybody else tonight. That was great. You know, stuff like that. Assignments. Here's the one I think that is is a like a game changer. You have to finish your schoolwork, right? Good. So. We use the same concept with our assignments at the gym. And they are expected to get those assignments done. Okay? You ever have a kid ever have a bad day on beam and not get it done? Frequently, or bars, or whatever. Okay? But put quality standards in the assignment and hold them to that. And it's not, it's not a bad thing, it's not a negative thing. It's just if you want to be successful at this level, here's what you gotta accomplish. And if they're not, then you know maybe we placed them at the wrong level. Maybe they're not giving it enough. Maybe they're, you know, whatever. So, um, so we use it like a homework. And a lot of times, very frequent, like at our gym, is we have a staggered optional group. So the one group is done at 5:30, but the other group doesn't isn't done until 7:30. So a lot of times, kids after after strength, you know, we line them up, dismiss them, whatever. Some of them will go back, put their grips back on because they have to finish up the bar assignment. Some will have to go back to B and finish up. We never send them back to, to floor and vault because that would be unproductive. You just can't be productive on it, going back to it those events a second time. Um, but if we hold them accountable to those assignments, and if they can't stay, maybe their carpool is leaving. We usually like it when they come up to say, hey, you know what, you know what, coach, I can't stay tonight, but I'm like, okay, when, when can you make it up? I can come in, early, I can come in half hour early tomorrow. Go, okay, great. So usually we ask that they finish that by the end of the week, okay? Because there's carpools, there's homework, there's other things. But then if, if, it, if it's a common thing that they're not getting their assignments done, that's the same thing with the attendance. That's when we'll have that discussion saying, hey, you know what, maybe you're just not ready to be level 10 this year. Is it, is it too much? Is it? And if you frame it in the situation that you're trying to do what's best for that kid for a positive experience, um, it's usually accepted really well. You know, it's not like, you didn't get your homework done. No, we're, we're not going to compete you. You know, it's, it's how you approach it, I think, is the important thing. Yeah. So that makes sense for older kids and higher levels. How yep. would you adapt that for some of your little kids? Yeah, same thing. When they're in the optional level, same thing. Even like even the other ones. Um, but it's funny thing is usually those aren't the kids that have problems. <laughs> Because if they're younger and in the optional levels, they're usually pretty good, and they're usually the fastest moving kids we have. They tend to slow down over time, right. and I don't, I don't think our compulsory staff uses quite that strict of a deal, and that's more the age that they're working with. But yeah, I, your ten-year-old level nine, I'm sorry, we still are held accountable for those. What about your six and seven-year-olds? Uh, probably not. They're, they're not in the optional levels. So they're probably a little bit less strict. I mean, it's, it's a gradual thing, you know? So, so anyways, love the placement that was right. Character, who thinks character is important? Oh. So, I mean, if we can teach our kids any one thing, teach them character, you know? So we have, we have team requirements and a, and a team agreement that they sign every year. They say, I don't remember exactly what it is, but I know the first thing is be a good person. You're gonna be a person for the rest of your life. You're only going to be a gymnast for a few more years, so you better be a better person than you are a gymnast. Um, two, we expect our kids to outwork every kid that they're going to have to compete against. So we don't ask a level seven to outwork our elite kids, but we do ask them to try to outwork all the other level sevens. We tell them that we want you, when you sit on a floor for a stretch period at a meet, we want you to be able to look around at the other 60 kids and say, I've outworked all those kids. I deserve to win today. That's the attitude we want our kids to have when they go to a meet. So, um, character, how they treat teammates or others. You know, correct them when they don't do it. 
humility. We ask for our kid, that our kids cheer for other teams more than they cheer for our own team. Um, teach and encourage competitiveness. This one I think is, is, is a tough one and a hard one. Um, I think I, I feel pretty lucky, pretty blessed that my staff is pretty good at this, I think. We will always end kids on and challenge them and we'll do things like, hey, she just caught a release. Are you gonna, you gonna go home without catching yours? You know, if that's taken in the right way, it becomes a competition. If that's taken the wrong way, then that, you have to be careful. You know, you got two 13-year-old kids that don't like each other anyways, I probably wouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. But it's another true story. This is one, when you get those little kids, um, we, we had a, I only know because my daughter was in this group, there was three kids on an extra workout Saturday morning they all were you know, like young level tens. They had just learned their tkacha that week for the first time. And I had to go get, a, I don't make a pot of coffee or something, or go do something in the office. So they're like, hey, Mike, look at this. I'm like, I caught again today. I'm like, I tried not to get too excited. You know, they caught the first cut. So I'm like, well, great, where was the second one? Well, what do you mean? Well, why didn't you keep cast and do another one? <laughs> oh, okay, okay, I'll do that. So pretty soon, pretty soon it turned into a contest three kids to see who could do the most. Kip, cast, gotcha, kip, cast, gotcha, kip, cast, gotcha on the pit bar. So I walked out, came back about 20 minutes later, and I all right, all right, Mike, watch this, watch this. <laughs> Literally all three of these kids, I think they were between the age of like 11 and 14. Um, I think they all had done at least a set of seven. <laughs> the winner was 11. <laughs> Her butt scraped the bar on the last three. <laughs> but he darn it if she was not going to win that contest. Do you know what her, what her name was? Maggie. You know who the other one was? Yeah. I don't remember who the third one was, but yeah. So teach, encourage competitiveness and truly encourage games. And if, if they if they buy into it, they think we tell them it's it's okay to look at your teammates and try to do better than them. You're only making everybody better in the process, so. All right, well, I know we're on time, so I'm gonna plow through this, so. Fall seven times and stand up eight. No brain. Practice puts brains in your muscles. I just like that once I put it in here. Personality, how to develop them. This is another tough one, but give them lots of opportunities. Who makes your kids stand up and talk to the rest of the team? It's like really important. I think you need to do that. Give them opportunities to do that. Um, make them talk, lead in front of the rest of the team. Um, encourage them to communicate with the coaches. That's more of a just, hey, do this, you know. Teach them to set realistic goals. Um, teach them to be happy and enjoy what they're doing. Um, our goal is to get them to walk that fine line between playing and absolutely busting their butts. Okay, and you can, uh, who's crossed that line? You cross it daily, cross it weekly, okay? But I'm a firm believer that if you have fun, you get more done, and, and you're going to work harder if you if you have if you're having fun. Um, so one of one of the really simple ways we get the kids to read to stand up and talk to the other kids is we keep a quote jar around. I'm a big I'm a big fan of quotes. I think you can kids can learn a lot from that. So a lot of times if I don't have anything to talk to them at the end of the day, I'll gather around like, all right, who gets quote today? Three or four kids will grab a quote out of the quote jar. And sometimes you make the kid that will never do that herself. You make them stand up there, read, read the quote to the rest of the team and, and tell what they think that means to them. You know, whatever, so. Technical stuff. Um, anyways, we can't change the amount of raw talent they have, but we can improve their athletic ability. And, and I think I'm the luckiest guy in the world the last 10, 15 years since I've started to step back from the day-to-day -day coaching because um, because I've got a, a coaching staff that physically prepares our kids so well that what do I get to work with? Strong, fast, flexible, talented. I learned a lot from you, Mary. But my staff is really good at it too, so don't get me wrong. Um, so they are. So I, I haven't done, but the thing I'm most scared of this year, I'm doing the JO training camp and Tom Cole makes every clinician do one warm up. I'm like shaking in my boots. I'm like, oh, God, I hate warm-ups. Warm -ups. <laughs> Luckily, I'm bringing two coaches with them. They're going to actually do it for me. <laughs> cop out. I know, cop out. Um, 
So yeah, so devote some time for training the physical, don't just jump into skills right away. Devote some time to physically prepping them to be better kids. Um, if you guys have to get up and walk off, I'm fine with that. I know there's a half hour between sessions, but I'm five minutes over, I tend to get wordy, especially when I talk about topics that are passionate to me, so. Um, areas that include your training plan. Physical abilities, basics, air sense. Teach them skills before they need them. Teach them toughness. Teach injury management. Physical abilities, do it during warm-ups. Do it during strength and flexibility. Get a dance teacher in the air once or twice a week if you have the ability to. Um, get a yoga teacher, get a Pilates teacher, get any other form of strength that's applicable. applicable. Better than physical, you can't. We're not gonna inherit a Simone, but maybe we can create one. All right, we can't, but we can get close. That could be the goal. Good basics. My college, anyone know John Roethlisberger? His dad was my college coach. Here's one thing I will never forget. He told me as a freshman in college, we were complaining because he was making us do basics. He's like, listen, Andre, you want to you want to learn that new skill in Bumblehorse in 200 reps or 2,000 reps? I'm like, 200? Good, do your basics then. So I'm like, okay, I get it, I get it. Fred was brilliant. I love that man. So um, one of the things I use a lot of times, I don't, I haven't been in charge of bars for about 10 years. So when I do get a chance to coach men bars. Here's my go-to. I make my level tens, try to do a level seven bar routine that scores a nine five or better. Usually that takes 20 minutes. And I'm like, guys, yes. do we have to? I'm like, if you can't score a nine five on a level seven bar routine, how can we expect you to score a nine five on a level 10 bar routine? Is it magically gonna get better when you're doing our skills? No. So that's it. So really I think I that's a that's a basic term. Tremendously important. Air sense. Air sense. Who is a tramp in your gym? Who is a tumble track in your gym? Make sure those pieces of equipment are never empty. Never, never, never empty. Um, especially in this day and age when the sport gets harder, you need trampoline, you need tumble track, you need soft surfaces, you need um, kids coming back from injuries, kids from, you know, it's just going to accelerate the whole process. So I don't know if it's getting better now, but you know, college coaches usually will tell us that about 70 to 80% of the kids they get in there hate tramp. And I'm like, are you kidding? You know, I, I think you make it a goal that your kids can do all of their tumbling passes on the trampoline. You can do 10 mil backs on tramp way easier, way faster than you can do 10 mil backs on the floor. A lot less pounding on your body, you're gonna live a lot longer. Well, maybe not live longer, but you know what I mean. Your body's gonna hold up longer. Um, more reps, less pounding. We teach every half twist in both a tuck shape and a laid out shape. It's just kind of a common thing we've done. Three back flips in a row, back flips on higher level scales. Do you want to see, you guys want to see some videos on these or do you want me to skip over these? This is a, this is a sequence that we make all of our kids start learning when they're level seven. And we make them do it in sequence like this just to kind of keep their head straight. Most of our sevens can get up to a one and a half. they do that, it's just more tools. Same thing in a layout shape, I'm not gonna make you watch that. Um, we teach kids to do backflips into and out of skills. Backflips into skills teach them a better take-up angle, better position. We teach them backflips out of skills. That teaches them to see the landing, to put their feet down. We teach them Cody's. This is the how to teach it. No, ignore the spot. This was lame, but I had to have something on video. Normally, it's you catch the kid and save their life. Her life didn't mean saving. Hey, okay. okay, young kid, probably at level seven, doing this. Now we're going to use this as a tool to teach them how to trick. What concept, is this concept important for us? Twist before flip. Is that an important concept? Who's ever made the correction you twisted too early? Trampoline is a good place to develop good habits where you can develop that concept of you need to generate flip before you twist. Because then you can do things like this. Guess what her vault is? Bad God. Kaboom. 
Of all the things we do on tramp, this one probably has the most directly related to your Chenko vaulting of anything we've ever come up with. And the pain in the butt is it takes probably two, three, four weeks to learn the basic skill. Once you learn it, though, you have a tool that they can do when they're hurt, when they're injured, when they're um, a lot of our kids. I mean, even 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 our elite kids don't finish a ball workout. You know, maybe they're competing. Uh,